Hi everyone, my name is Aaliyah and for week three of the Urban Green series I'm here to talk to you about how you might survey your own garden for insects and how you might report what you find if you think you've come across something exotic. I work for Caesar where it's actually my job to go out surveying for insects on farms. Um, so that's I guess where I'm getting some of these tips which I'll be sharing with you. Now to get started um, I just wanted to set our expectations as far as whether we're going to be going out and identifying a lot of species of insects when we start getting out into our gardens. Uh, because, you know, we, we can certainly do this for a lot of other types of animals. Um, for instance, if you're a birder, it's, it's not completely out of the question to think that you might be able to, to check off a list of all the bird species in Australia. There's only about 800 of them. Um, globally, there's 10,000 species of birds, which cer certainly seems a bit more insurmountable. Um, so what does this look like for insects? Well, we're, we've got over a million species of insects globally. Um, just in Australia, probably 200,000 and only about 60,000 of them are even described. So you can see we're talking about an entirely different um, order of magnitude when we're comparing insects to other more familiar critters like birds or mammals. And so for that reason, because you know, we need some way of organizing all these species, um, we use different levels of hierarchy where we group species based off of how similar they are, um, referred to as taxonomic groupings. And so just to give you an example of, of how these groupings look as we go down, the next highest up level from species is genus. So this is the equivalent of instead of saying that's a superb fairy wren, we might say, well, that's a fairy wren, one of the fairy wrens, I'm not sure which. Um, there's only about 2000 genera of birds in the world. For insects though, we've still got about 12,000, still just too many to, to really be learning. Okay, the next highest up group is families. This is the equivalent of saying that's a wren or that's a finch. Um, in Australia, we've probably only got about 100 bird families. And insects, we're still up over 1,000. So again, if you're, if you're trying to get down to the family level for insects, it's gonna be a huge task. So let's keep backing up. Now we've reached orders, which is a much larger taxonomic grouping. It's the equivalent of looking at a bird and saying, that's a songbird. I don't know what kind, but it's a songbird. And for insects, it's the equivalent of looking at an insect and saying, well, that's a beetle. I don't know what kind, but you know, looks like a beetle. And finally, we've reached a manageable number of different groups that we might want to try and learn, and that's orders of insects. And so these are things like the level beetle, coleoptera, or the level butterfly and moth, lepidoptera. Those are orders. And here's just an example of, of how this looks um, within the group of beetles, for instance. And so here you can see some pictures at the top row of a whole bunch of different beetle species that I've found um, around our place at the beginning of the year, lots of different color and variety. Um, if we try and group them, we can, we can try and group them by genus, that next, that next highest level, and we find that these three, they're all pretty closely related, they all fall into the same genus. Um, everybody else though, still quite different. We can move to families. Now we can actually group all of these little guys were leaf beetles. Um, these two here were both weevils. These guys were both darkling beetles and we have a scarab over here. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good way of distinguishing. You know, it doesn't take an expert to tell a weevil from a scarab. Um, but here then if we keep backing up to orders, we can just call them all beetles. And not until we zoom out even further, do we start to include the non-insect invertebrates? And they fall outside of that million species I mentioned before. Um, if you keep backing up, you find that there's um, a class of insects, but there's also a class that includes other six-legged invertebrates like the columbula. And you have to keep backing up to an even higher grouping before you start to get the spiders, the millipedes, the centipedes, and so forth. And so for instance, spiders, there's another 100,000 species um, of, spider, um, of spider, so just too many to deal with. So the whole point of that was really just to, I guess, get you prepared for how hard it is to identify insects to species. And I'm a professional entomologist and I never can ID things to species unless it's a super common um, crop pest or garden pest. Uh, more often than not, I might have a hard time even getting farther than orders. So, you know, don't feel bad if that's pretty much all you're doing um, because what I'm gonna do today is give you some tips for relying on experts who are focusing on taxonomy to help you identify things past this point. Um, and I'm also not gonna spend today talking about how to identify those big groupings. That would be a whole nother talk. 
Um, and the reason is, is because it's just inevitable you're going to come across an invertebrate in your garden that you won't know where to start, even if you know some of the common ones. So I want to focus tonight on just general advice and tips for where to start when you, when you just don't know. So we're going to start here with what sort of invertebrates you might see in your garden. And I guess what I've been saying up to this point is sort of the difficulty of even identifying an invertebrate when you find it. But there's a whole nother issue, which is often you're not even going to see the invertebrate. You're going to see the damage it leaves behind. Um, and how do you match that then to an invertebrate and identify who's been causing damage on your plants? And you might see a lot of different forms of damage caused by invertebrates. You might see, you might see chewing damage. You might see um, discoloration caused by um, viruses that have been transferred by insects. You might see little, little silvery trails. Um, it's quite a variety. And we obviously want to be able to match this to a culprit. And so you might see some insects sort of near the damage, you know, that might leave them red-handed. Um, I'll, I'll have you ponder about whether you think this little critter here is responsible for that big hole chewed in the leaf. Um, but essentially, we want to take the same approach we took to how we might identify species and instead focus on bigger groups. And similarly with damage, we can try and focus on bigger groups of what sorts of damage might be formed. And in this case, we can match general insect mouth parts to general types of damage. And that will get us started on identifying who's been chewing in our garden. So speaking of chewing, we're going to start with the chewers. So these are a whole range of different um, invertebrate and insect species. Um, they can be extremely different, not even closely related, but they all form this sort of chewing damage because they have mouth parts that are like, you know, big mandibles and just chew away. And they create ragged edges. Um, they might leave holes in the leaf. And this includes, you know, our really famous chewers like caterpillars. Also a lot of um, invertebrates that live in the soil, like millipedes and slaters and earwigs, uh, grasshoppers, and even um, beetles that have really powerful mandibles can, can chew in, into wood and bark. And so we get wood boring beetles. And I, I do think this is just about the cutest beetle I've ever seen. Then very differently to the chewers, we have the piercers and suckers. And instead of having um, mandible like mouth parts, all they have is a sharp straw that they use to stick down into a leaf or stem, tap into the plant's phloem network, and sip out all the juices. And this includes true bugs. And so here we have our bug from the beginning of the talk, so we can determine that it would have been unfair to blame that chewing hole on this little, on this little bug. It also includes aphids, who are a very notorious garden pest, um, psyllids as well. It includes mites, which can create this silvering damage when they tap into a leaf and sip out all the green. And you might get a variety of different symptoms from piercers and suckers. You often won't be able to see the actual hole they poke because it'll be so small, but that hole might open the plant up to infections of fungus or virus. So you might see discoloration around, um, around little, little entry points. You might just see generally wilty looking plants. Um, you might see sap leaking from stems where holes have been poked, um, and you might see signs of virus being transmitted to your plants through um, discoloration in leaves. The next group we have are the scrapers. Um, these are slugs and snails. They probably have the weirdest mouth parts. Um, they have a tongue that's just covered with thousands of tiny little teeth called radula. You can see in this gif when he pops his little tongue out, you can just barely make out all those little, um, the, rough, the rough surface. The damage that these guys create can look really similar to chewers. Um, sometimes it looks a bit more raggedy, but it can actually be quite difficult to distinguish um, between a chewer and a scraper if all you see is the damage on a plant. Though of course, sometimes these guys leave a little slimy trail in the morning that um, leaves them red-handed. The next group is the hooked mouths. These are actually my favorite group, it includes maggots and miners. These are all maggots, essentially. They're larvae of flies. They have a um, little hooked mouth part that they use to pull plant or fruit material into their, into their bodies. It includes fruit flies, um, which just might create kind of general mushiness in a fruit. Um, they get in through, through an already rotten or, or broken part of a fruit where they can get in through the skin and start feeding in the soft material. It also includes leaf miner flies. Um, and this is the group I've actually been studying for the last few years. 
and you can see this is a leaf miner fly larvae and that little black mouth part at the front you can see the mouth hook and in this case I think they went for the the most appropriate name of an insect because um, their mouth hook really looks just like a little miner's pickaxe hence the name leaf miner and they create much more distinct um, distinct trails um, in leaves um, these little white white twirling silvering patterns and when these guys grow up the adult flies can create their own another kind of damage in the case of leaf miner flies um, the, the mums lay eggs in the leaf. They also feed from the leaf by using their ovipositor, which is this little black bit you can see that she's stuck down into the leaf, jabs it around, breaks up the cells, and then steps back to have a sip of the good plant juices that leak out. And it creates these perfect little white circles on a leaf, which we call stippling damage. So that's a sign of, of leaf miner fly activity. Um, that was absolutely not um, a complete covering of all the different types of plant damage you might see, just some common things and some big groups you might be able to narrow it down to, um, but hopefully gives you a good starting point. But of course, we can't really identify what we found unless we manage to then observe the insect that was causing that damage. So what I'll go over next is just some tricks and some tools you can use to narrow in on, on particular insects. But before we get into that, I do just want to give a couple general points to keep in mind when you go out into your garden to start surveying for insects. The first is that if you do find an insect and you start trying to identify it, there is a good chance it's going to look nothing like what its top hit on Google might look like. And that's because a lot of insects have incomplete and complete metamorphosis, both of which dramatically change the appearance of the insect across its life cycle. Um, and so this ladybird here is a pretty great dramatic example. Um, the larvae and the adult form look like completely different critters. Um, same goes for a lot of beetles, like this darkling beetle, where you can see its larvae are what we sometimes call mealybugs and feed to pet lizards. Um, and they even live in a completely different um, microhabitat than the adult. They like to be under the ground, chewing at roots, um, roots and, and, and sort of breaking down plant material down here, whereas the adults might be um, sticking to the surface. And even if we don't have complete metamorphosis, some insects have incomplete metamorphosis. They don't completely change shape, but they still often change colors quite dramatically. And again, it just makes it really hard to identify from these younger life stages. And then the other thing to keep in mind is you might not find the culprit near the damage. You know, remember back to that little, um, that little bug that was almost blamed for a chewing hole that it did not create. Um, and that's because a lot, of, a lot of these life stages can be really mobile, um, and they also might not be active when you're active. So it could be that the culprit has been coming up every night up from the soil, chewing on the plants, and then returning back underground um, to a hidden home or a hidden shelter. And that's true for a lot of these soil-dwelling pests. The other thing to keep in mind is you're going to see a lot of insects and invertebrates, and some of them are going to be beneficials. And unfortunately, as we have discussed in, in the previous weeks, there's no real hard and fast rules for distinguishing a pest from a beneficial. Lizzie gave some good tips, such as they might have bigger, stronger looking mouth parts. So for instance, this guy here, we can see he's a piercer or a sucker. He's got that straw, but it's a hefty straw, uh, much bigger than it would really need to be tapping into a leaf. And that's because this is a predatory assassin bug and it uses its straw to tap into other insects. Um, Lizzie also mentioned eyesight's a good indicator, so like jumping spiders with these big bright eyes on, front of their, on the front of their faces. Um, they might be very mobile, like these lacewing larvae, and again with pretty impressive mouth parts up here. Um, but some of them you really just have to start getting familiar um, because there's not a lot of indicators just based on its body that it's a predator. And I think these tiny little wasps are kind of an example of that. They don't look particularly dangerous, but um, if you're an aphid, you have a high chance someone's gonna, one of these is gonna come along and lay an egg inside of you. And the more you get out in your garden, getting familiar with the insects and, and what they seem to be doing, you'll start to, to be able to distinguish the friends from the foes. So with that, let's actually get into tips for conducting surveys. Um, and this is pretty much what I do when I'm actually out and about surveying farms for insects. As my job, it's really not fancy as you'll see. Um, I find, more than, more than anything, I just like to rely on a visual search of plants. And what that involves is getting down to bug level. You really have to, you know, get down in there um, and get a really close look, look around at the tops and bottom of leaves. Um, 
move really slowly. Try not to actually touch a lot of plants or leaves at first because a lot of insects are very flighty. In the case of a lot of um, bugs and beetles, for instance, if they feel any movement up on a branch, they'll just let go of the branch, lose their grip and fall to the ground because they'd rather take their chances on the ground than when, with whatever was, was moving their branch. So the, the more hands off you can be at first, the more chance you'll have of potentially seeing some, some activity. Um, if I don't see much, then I'll start getting in and, and handling the leaves. I like to look for anything that's kind of a nice protected spot that might make a good sheltered home for an insect, you know, away from, away from predators, away from, you know, strong, um, strong light or heat, just anything that, you know, looks like a good house. And so that might include where leaves have been stuck together, curled around a bit, um, you can see there's two harlequin bugs here taking advantage of a nice little curled leaf for some intimate time. Aphids really like looking for nice tight curled places and leaves. You can see these guys are grouping down at the base um, of a curled blade. And so those, those are, you know, those are really good places to be checking. You also want to be keeping a really close eye out for camouflage because um, you can miss a lot if, you know, if you don't, if you're not looking really closely. And Lizzie had mentioned wraparound spiders in her talk last week, and I'm very proud to say I've found one before in my entire life. It's this guy here. Um, and if you really, you know, if you weren't going really slow, you could look right past something like that. And if you're, and if you're digging around in your garden doing some planting, it's really good to sift through the soil as you go and keep an eye out for any grubs or pupae, um, the sort of less mobile life stages that can't really run away from you. And you'll get different results if you try having a survey of your garden at different times of the day and of course different seasons. Now you're not going to see all your um, invertebrate life that way. A lot of things are just too sneaky really to be observed um, just by looking around. And so for that there's a lot of different traps and tools you can use and they all work on different invertebrates based off of what their behavior is like. Um, so you may have heard about using sticky traps. Um, these yellow sticky traps up here you can get at hardware stores. They work on small flying insects that are attracted to the color yellow. Sometimes you can even add a lure to sticky traps. Um, fruit flies, for instance, you can find recipes online to make your own lures. Sometimes they're red sticky traps if the insect likes red. Um, I'm not crazy about them as far as trying to identify insects though because you can see what you catch gets all gummed up and glue can be really difficult to, to try and identify. Yellow pan traps work on a very same level. They're yellow and insects like to fly into them. Um, but instead of having glue, you just fill these with a bit of water, put in a couple drops of detergent. That just helps break the surface tension um, and set it on the ground and you'll get little flying insects flying into there. This one's one of my favorite tools. It's a beet sheet and it works um, on the premise that I mentioned earlier that a lot of beetles and bugs and, and, um, and other invertebrates either don't have a great grip on branches when they start to wiggle or their response is to drop as soon as they feel any threat. So if you hold a big white sheet underneath um, shrubs or trees and you just smack at the branches above with a stick, you'll get a lot of invertebrate life falling down into the sheet. You can also set your own pitfall trap and this is as fancy as a plastic cup buried in the dirt. Make sure the dirt is nice and flush with the lid and insect life that is crawling around on the ground. At, um, they work really good for things that come out at night. Uh, we'll just walk in and fall in and you'll be able to check them in the morning. And you also, just like the pan trap, you fill this with about half full of water, add a couple drops of detergent. And then the simplest of the bunch that still gets its own fancy name is a shelter trap. And it's literally, you put a piece of wood on the ground and it makes a nice little shelter for invertebrates that like to find um, find a good hidden spot to hide away the day and then you can just flip flip the wood or flip the you know flower pot or whatever you've put down on the ground um, every now and again to see if there's any invertebrates sheltering out there during the daytime. So let's say either just by visually surveying or actually using um, those some of those traps you have found an insect or an invertebrate. Um, what is it? You want to identify it. Well, the first step is always to get as good of a photo as you possibly can. Um, and really, we don't have to look further than just using our phones. You don't need a fancy camera to do this. If you use an Android phone, you're in luck because there is a really great macro focus setting just in the automatic um, camera app. And if you open your camera and you swipe right, it takes you to this page and you have a little option here, Pro. So you click that because you are a pro at insect photography. 
and you get this window where you have an option to click MF, which is manual focus. You slide the slider all the way to the left to the flower, that's the macro feature, and it'll let you um, move your phone closer to the insect to control the actual focus rather than the phone constantly trying to readjust focus. And you can get pretty good pictures of larger things like beetles that way. If you're trying to go for something really small, I really recommend getting a clip-on macro lens, which you can attach to your phone. Um, and these are cheap, they're easy to get online. Um, this, this is the one I love to use. It's only $12 um, a pixel. I got it off eBay. And you can clip this onto your phone camera and you can see, again, use it with the, with, the, with the focus control, the manual focus setting makes it a lot easier. And you can see I've gone from trying to take a picture of that tiny little spider here, sticking on the macro lens, zooming in on my phone. And I've gotten a picture that's, it's not, you know, great, but it's good enough that I could try and start identifying maybe what, you know, what family that spider's in or just one of those larger groups. So now you have your photo, how do you actually identify? And so this is where we kind of come back to the start of the talk where, where I said, if you're able to tell to a very high grouping what you're looking at, is it a beetle? Is it a spider? Is it a butterfly? Is it a grasshopper? You know, the, 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 the pretty simple stuff. Um, there's a lot of resources that can help you take it from there. And my absolute favorite is iNaturalist, um, which is an app that was originally made in the States, but it's used globally now. Um, it's getting really popular. You can see um, this is just the, the desktop app's front page. There's been 46, over 46 million observations logged through this app now. O almost 300,000 species identified, um, a million and a half or so active viewer users. Um, so it's, it's a really, really great resource and just a really fun app to use. Um, and because I think um, um, it's still sort of catching on in Australia. I'll just go through a few slides of how to use it if you've never used it before, which should hopefully give you a good start for trying it out. So you can see here, this is what the um, interface looks like on my phone. It's really great because it assists in identifications and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, I also just love that it helps me organize my insect photos. And if you're trying to start, if you're trying to get more familiar with what's in your garden, how that changes across season, uh, across year, you know, this is a great way to just scroll back through your records of what photos you've logged before and you can start to, you can start to notice the really common species. Um, you can even click into these and, and read more about the actual species, look at what timing other folks have reported them. Um, really, really useful for getting a, um, a sense of how your garden is changing through time. You can also join citizen science projects, um, which is a great way to not just contribute to science, but also to connect with experts who can help you, you know, with help with help you with your own learnings. And um, all the data that gets collected is absolutely, you know, useful in science because this app is integrated with some really important biodiversity databases, like Atlas of Living Australia, you may have heard of. Um, so it all it's it all goes um, to support science as well. So let's just go over how you can get help with your identifications of insects by using iNaturalist. And the very first way is that it comes already with an image recognition, recognition software, which means that you open it up, you upload your photo, pretty much the first thing you get is suggestions for what the app software thinks your photo is. And you can see here, I've uploaded a picture of this little spider and iNaturalist is telling me, well, I'm pretty sure it's a part of this spider genus. And sometimes you'll actually get the top recommendation being the exact species you uploaded a photo of. And here's some examples of where that's happened with my photos. Um, these are the photos I've uploaded, and this is the recommendations by iNaturalist. You can see it got the mealybug destroyer, got the southern green stink bug, um, both pretty common species, which is why it does so well. It's had a lot of photos of uh, already uploaded that trains the software. Um, but it even got this little kind of obscure leaf miter fly, which there's like six people in Australia who like to study leaf miter flies. So sometimes it surprises you with, with how well it does. Um, but also have your expectations ready to be very disappointed by the algorithm because sometimes it makes really dumb mistakes. And it is just software after all. Um, mistakes like thinking a spider is a plant sort of thing but it's still a very useful starting point. And so what I always do, first thing off is when I see an insect, I don't know what it is. 
I upload the picture to iNaturalist, um, and not just insect, by the way, you can do this. I do this with plants all the time because I'm pretty rubbish with plants. iNaturalist is for any, any type of, of life, plant or animal. But here you can see I've uploaded the spider. iNaturalist has given me a recommendation. I'm not convinced because you can see the spider in the recommendation is a little orange guy, whereas I've kind of got a more green and brown spider. Uh, first thing I do though is I pop the name of this recommendation into Google Images and I have a look and right here within the first 10 or so pictures, there's my spider. So a naturalist was right after all. Now the second way it helps you with your identifications is as long as you can tag your picture to a really high level, like an order, you know, so say this is a beetle, this is a grasshopper, and that image recognition software is going to be really helpful to get you there. If you can do that, it is absolutely still worth posting that because there's a huge active expert community using iNaturalist. Um, just a lot of folks who are taxonomists by trade and like to spend their time identifying photos for people. And a lot of them sort by one particular group. So they might be a taxonomist who's really interested in beetles, so they just sort by beetles. So if you've tagged your picture beetle, it's more likely to pop up in their feed. And you get folks, if you start uploading insects to iNaturalist, I guarantee you're gonna, you're gonna see some activity from this fellow, Ryan Richter, who has, you can see, 60,000 identifications made on this app. So incredibly prolific. Um, and you can see these little pink tags on my, on my front page. That's where folks have been giving me identifications. Um, where, you know, I uploaded this as B and I've had somebody help me get all the way down to genus. And you don't have to worry if you get it wrong. I get them wrong quite frequently um, because it's a crowdsourced, you know, platform for identification. You'll get folks correcting, correcting the mistake. They can leave comments explaining why it's actually this group and not this group. And so it's really great for learning. Um, but I'll stop there because I could ramble on about iNaturalist for quite a while. Um, but essentially, if we've kind of gone through that process, we've started getting more familiar with our garden, we've been doing some surveys, we start to see who the usual pests are, the usual activity, the usual damage. You know, we've started identifying some insects, maybe with the help of an app like iNaturalist. Um, but one day you may find something in your garden that just seems really unusual and you suspect it might be exotic. Uh, maybe it's because you've just never seen anything like it or because it kind of looks similar to something you've heard about as being an exotic pest. So what do you do? Now, unfortunately, it's going to be um, extremely rare, probably almost never the case that we could just see damage in our garden and know that's caused by a new exotic pest. And that's because so much of the damage caused by exotic pests that we know about overlaps quite a lot in appearance with a lot of the damage created by the native and naturalized species we already have in Australia. And here's a really great example. This is all leaf mining damage. Um, and you might see a lot of this in your garden. Um, this is a cabbage leaf miner, really common in nasturtiums and brassicas. This leaf miner is very common in south thistles around the city. But if this leaf miner that caused this picture ever popped up in Australia, that would, or in um, outside of quarantine zones in Australia, that would be a big worry because this is an exotic leaf miner fly called vegetable leaf miner fly that right now is only restricted to the very northern tip of Australia in a quarantine zone. But if it showed up in your garden, the damage itself might not look um, very, very suspicious to you because you may have seen leaf mining damage before from all these different native species in the outer squares. But the way that you might determine something's up is that this leaf miner fly likes different plants than the natives do. So if you start seeing a whole bunch of leaf mines in your tomatoes and you don't really remember ever seeing that before, that's a sign that you've got an exotic that's come in. And so this guy here really loves tomatoes, melons, beans, and none of those plants really have a lot of activity of native leaf miners right now. So essentially what I'm just trying to say is what you're really trying to do when staying vigilant for exotics is be familiar with the norm in your garden so that you can spot changes in patterns because that's gonna be your, you know, your first clue something's off in a lot of cases. And you can get a bit familiar with the highest risk exotic pests that are out there. Um, there's a lot of resources. Jess is gonna talk about it a little bit more in, in, the, in the talk just after mine. Um, you can go to the um, Department of Agriculture and Water uh, website to read a bit more about priority pests. And here's just some examples that you've already heard about in our previous sessions, such as brown marmorate stink bug. So you might know 
this species really likes apples and stone fruit. So you could be particularly um, keeping a particularly close eye on your orchard trees for, for lots of unexplained um, piercing and sucking damage. Or this is the spotted wing drosophila, which is a fruit fly, but unlike the fruit fly we already have, it can actually get into fresh fruits. So if you start to see a lot of this larval feeding damage in otherwise healthy looking fruits, you know, that's a sign that something's amiss. We already talked about the leaf miner fly. Um, and there's, there's a whole range of other exotics where having a sense of their favorite hosts can just help you keep an eye out for, for um, activity in those hosts that seem unusual. If you find something you think is exotic, um, always take a photo first thing. If you can actually catch the insect, maybe you actually caught it in one of your traps, um, but if you can actually catch it, that's really great. Um, you can take a sample of it. It's as simple as putting it in a plastic bag or a Tupperware. You can put in a bit of paper towel to control humidity, a bit of what it was eating, just so you can try and keep it alive a little bit longer. Um, and it may seem a bit like a no-brainer at the time, but if you write a label on the bag or the box with um, some of the information from the day that you found it, the date, your address, the type of plant it was on, um, any, any damage you saw around it, and your name, because you may end up giving this sample to um, a biosecurity official, that is very useful. And then what you do is you call the exotic plant pest hotline right away. And it's always the same number, no matter where you are. In Victoria, you'll get diverted to Agriculture Victoria. Um, and they're gonna be interested in some of that information that you would have already recorded um, when you took your sample or your photo. They'll want, they'll want to see the photo. They'll wanna know the GPS location. They'll wanna know more about what plant you caught it on, what you saw on that plant. Um, and they, they'll, they'll, they'll explain to you the next steps. They may wanna come do a site visit. They may wanna come get your sample um, and so forth, but it'll all be treated um, confidentially and, and you'll get somebody who's very, who's very experienced in this. And so for that reason, don't, you know, don't feel, don't feel bad about calling the hotline if you think you see something weird, but you don't, you know, you may have made a mistake um, because it'll put you in touch with folks who are going to be a lot better at identifying those species than you will be. Um, and that's the end of the talk. Thanks very much for listening um, and happy to answer some questions now. Thanks, Leah. If anyone has any questions for Aaliyah, feel free to either put them in the chat or take yourself off mute, um, questions or comments. While we wait for a couple to go through, I might just share my screen. You spend a lot of time monitoring around your farm, Aaliyah. What are, what are some of the more common insects that you come across? Well, I'll out myself for not really having any garden plants um, at our place. <laughs> so most of the insects that, that, that I find are, are things that are um, eating in um, eucalypt trees um, and, and native plants like that, as well as grass weeds. We've had, um, we've had a lot of mites around lately. Um, Red-legged earth mites are a critter that will be a problem in, in your garden that you'll see. Um, we get a lot of those leaf beetles, which are beautiful little colorful, um, colorful small beetles that like to feed in eucalypt trees. Um, we've had, um, we've had some pretty cool um, adult ant lions. First time I've ever seen one just flying around um, on the windows at night. Quite a nice variety. Got a comment from Helen, City of Casey are having a webinar on using iNaturalist sometime in the next few weeks. That's mm. fantastic. It's um, certainly happening um, with a few councils at the moment. Um, we've got a question from Leslie. What might the tiny flies be that come out in droves every time I open my compost bin? Oh, I think I, I have an inkling about this. What do you think, Leah? <laughs> I mean, I, I would suspect that's um, pretty prime fruit fly behavior. Um, but the, 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 the non-worrying kind of fruit fly, because it's the kind that gets into old rotting food. Um, so unlikely to be our exotic spotted wing um, drosophila that we're that we're keeping an eye out for since yep. they um, they will actually attack your fresh fruit. I do have a picture of this fly that will be in your compost bin um, Leslie that I can show you. Uh, Tina has a question. Tina did you want to um, take yourself off mute? Thank you yeah um, I'm just wondering how exotic a pest needs to be before it's considered exotic enough to ring the 1-800 number like I'm in Melbourne 
I've got a macadamia tree and I found what I've identified as the macadamia welt, uh, felt C-O-C-C-I-D, I don't know how to pronounce it. And a while ago, I found some stink bugs elsewhere in my garden. Um, and I've, I've put them up on iNaturalist, but uh, now that I know this number, are they things that are important enough that I should maybe be ringing the 1-800 number because they're not the usual aphids or something that I would normally see in my garden? I mean, I would say I would say it doesn't hurt to be better to be better safe than sorry, um, and and you'll you'll get the expert assistance that you need when you do call that number. Since obviously, you know, we we're not really expected to be able to identify stink bugs ourselves on the spot. Um, and if you do have photos already, um, or if you have an iNaturalist record, you can point someone to. It just you know potentially clears the process up much quicker because there are folks who can look at a photo of a stink bug. Um, and just from a photo, be able to say, no, that's not brown marmorated stink bug. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just add to that, Aaliyah. Um, th there, are, there are definitely cases, exotic pests tend to be put into categories by um, government biosecurity authorities, whether they're a priority plant pest or not. But there's certainly been cases where um, people have reported something they think is a little bit different. And... Um, biosecurity authorities have not necessarily been um, aware that it's becoming a problem overseas and um, and and it's and it's and it's been decided that it's a problem here so sometimes it can lead to entirely new information by community members making a report mm. there's also been some cases where um, somebody's posted something on a naturalist as you mentioned you have and an expert has commented saying Call the number. I know that's an exotic. Um, that's happened a few times in the US. Um, we've got a question from Pierre. I, I often, uh, I've often found a large white grub in the soil in the veggie garden. Uh, what could they be and are they detrimental? Um, that could be a lot of things. Um, there are quite a lot of insects that do have life stages that, that would be found if you're digging in soil. Um, a lot of beetle grubs, uh, weevil, weevil larvae, um, caterpillar, some, sort, some forms of moth larvae. And therefore it depends if they're detrimental or not um, because some of them are really just chewing on, on the sort of decomposing plant or bark material in the soil um, and are you know, not really harming your plants. But there are some that will actually crawl up out of the ground, um, chew on the plants above ground, or might chew on the roots of plants. And so, for instance, there's um, cockchafer beetles, um, have larvae that will come up above the ground and chew plants. So, what you can do is if you find one of these grubs, um, if you have a look at its mouth parts, you'll be able to see if, if it's got some, some pretty big, good looking chewing mouth parts like a cockchafer would. That might help you narrow in on whether it's going to be a pest or not. Um, but I would also say just see if you can find unexplained chewing damage, because if you're not really seeing much damage to plants, then finding the grubs in the ground is not really a worry. Hope that was helpful. <laughs> Got a question here about phylloxera. Uh, if it, if yes. it's a kind of flea or aphid, isn't it? Um, and is it widely present in Australia and Melbourne? And I may actually handball that to Paul Umina, who is on the chat and can type a response, since he probably knows a bit more about this than me. Yeah, so Paul's worked on phylloxera before. If, um, if you wouldn't mind um, responding to that, Paul, that would be excellent. Um, but in terms of its distribution, it's spora sporadically distributed. And you might have noticed driving down the highways that there are signs saying um, phylloxera free zone. Um, so there are regions that are still under protection where um, authorities are trying to keep phylloxera out of those wine grape growing regions. So that's um, pretty important to make sure you don't take um, great material into those zones. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> That's a good question, Lizzie. Are all earthworms good guys and are there different types? Oh, I have never heard of a bad guy earthworm. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yes, they're good guys. And yes, there are absolutely different types. I'm not really sure that you would find much difference in the benefit you get from different types. They're all pretty good at at turning over your soil and helping decomposition. Um, I have, however, seen some pretty massive earthworms, so that's definitely not your common variety. Um, things like a meter long earthworm that look like a Photoshop job. 
That's a, that's a great question. Maybe we can look into that a little further and um, put an answer in the email next week. All right. We don't have an awful lot of time left, so I'm just going to um, continue on from Malia. Um, I was just going to do a super quick overview on some plant pests, um, food garden pests that you might encounter over the next two or three months as we move into spring. Um, to do any sort of um, training around identification of these pests, we would, we would need a lot more time. Um, as Alia mentioned, um, Alia is an entomologist and sometimes Alia um, has trouble identifying um, insects. So it's a, it's a huge field, a huge um, field of knowledge. Um, but what we can do is give you a bit of an idea of some of the more common um, pests that you're likely to encounter. And I'm sure you would have encountered some of these before. Um, to sort of help you get that um, awareness of, of what's normal in your garden from a seasonal perspective and what might be counted as unusual because the theme that we're um, following um, throughout this series is plant health and plant biosecurity. So learning what is, um, what is normal in your garden so you can then identify what is, what is unusual. So there are a couple of species here that you might already see around. Green peach aphid is one. This is an aphid that you might see on um, brassica species, as well as cabbage aphid. Um, so you will likely see these um, in the winter months, but also their numbers might build up as you come into spring and the weather gets warmer. They tend to like warm weather. Um, and the thing about aphid species, which you may very well have noticed, the numbers build up very, very quickly um, because they actually produce asexually. So you just need one aphid to produce um, offspring, essentially. So they can, um, they can replicate very quickly. Um, and particularly in the case of some aphids, such as green peach aphids, they have a um, tendency to evolve um, resistance to um, chemicals that um, some might use to treat them with. So when it comes to um, aphid colonies and management of aphid colonies, sometimes the colonies can look pretty um, disheartening in your garden because they do build up in numbers. But as I mentioned last week, it's often not long before um, you see them start to be parasitized um, by our um, parasitic wasp friends. And you know that that is happening by keeping your eyes out for those um, bronze aphid mummies um, that I mentioned last week. Um, and if you haven't seen that, that um, session, um, have a look at the video. So I've got green peach aphid here and cabbage aphid, and you'll notice um, between these two aphids, um, there's a bit of a difference in how they look. This shot is a little bit more closer up, but you'll notice green peach aphid among other things. It's got this really shiny appearance. And you'll notice with cabbage aphid, it's got this almost furry matte appearance. Um, so there are lots of little morphological features you can use to differentiate aphids, but having a look at the, the texture, um, matte versus shiny, can sometimes give you a bit of a hint as to what might be in your garden. And then as we head um, further into the warm weather, if you've got ornamental plants, sometimes you'll see this other aphid around. It's got quite long legs, it's a rose aphid, um, particularly leading into um, bud burst um, on, on rose um, plants and, and other ornamentals. You can see them really start to build up in numbers but again, don't be too disheartened because usually the parasitic wasps are not too far behind. You might notice a really weird looking insect in your garden called the passion vine hopper. And you don't tend to get the adults on the bottom left here until later on in summer. At this time of year or leading into spring, you'll get the, um, the juveniles, which looks a little bit like something from Alien down the bottom here. And they're very tiny. But I think, um, many people probably would have noticed the passion vine hopper um, around. It's a native insect to Australia and it's unfortunately one that we've exported overseas to New Zealand where it's a real problem pest. And I'm sure that the white fly um, down the bottom here is um, another pest that um, you will commonly see in your garden. You can generally see these by the big cloud of white and wings when you shake a plant around. They're often hiding underneath the leaf. Um, and if you don't see the fly itself, which you usually would, 
you can often um, you can often see the um, honeydew and, and sooty mold growing on, on the honeydew that they um, they leave behind on the plant. So these all fall into the category of sucking pests, which Aaliyah mentioned earlier. You might also see some caterpillars around as the weather warms up, such as cabbage white butterfly and the um, Australian cabbage looper. And this is a photo of the looper actually that I showed uh, last week that was in fact parasitized at the time. And then later on when the weather really warms up and your um, apple and pear trees uh, start to bloom and um, produce fruit, you might notice um, if you're unlucky, pests such as light brown apple moth, which is a, a leaf roller and it's a very small caterpillar or codling moth, which is a, a caterpillar that drills down into um, apple, apple and pear into the flesh there. Um, so that's a bit of an unlucky find if you um, bite into an apple and you find a, a codling moth larvae in there. Someone asked a question earlier about um, white rubs in the soil. There's quite a few things that it could be, as Aaliyah mentioned. But um, occasionally, if you're digging through the soil ready to plant, you might notice um, things that look like these um, scarab larvae. So they're C-shaped and they usually have well, they have uh, basically little helmets on their heads. So they've got a, a hard head. And if you look closely, you can usually see um, their chewing mouth parts. And many of these um, scarab species are what we would call dung beetles um, or other scarab species. And we don't know a whole lot about them. Often they're reasonably benign. There are a couple of species that we know of that are um, pests of crops. Uh, and so you might find in, the, in your garden, if you find your plants have a weak root structure and you have good soil health and everything else is fine, but you are digging up a lot of these scarabs here, they, um, they might be your culprit. So in this case, this is actually called Argentine scarab. And some others that you might see, psyllids up the top here and the, um, the casings that the, the nymph of the psyllid produces it is called a, a lerp. And you can see the adult here on, on this leaf. And we've got lots of different psyllids in Australia. Um, the video that we showed at the start was an ABC case study of one called tomato potato silk. Now that is a psyllid that was actually first found in Australia in 2017. And it was found in someone's food garden in their backyard in Perth. And um, as it stands, we don't have this psyllid uh, in Victoria or Melbourne. Um, and, it, and it's a real agricultural crop pest. Um, it can carry a bacteria that um, causes a disease in potato called zebra tip chip disease. So it's not something that we want over here. And there is surveillance that, um, that is going on, um, undertaken by government, um, working with community as well, um, to make sure that we don't get tomato potato psyllid here. But um, essentially it's, a, it's something that, is, um, that there is information about online. And actually I might, I might put some information in our email to the group next week, just so you have a, a fact sheet on hand. Um, it's got a white stripe on its ab abdomen, so it's not too hard to pick out if you, if you do find it. So that's a new pest to Australia, and it's just actually an example of um, a pest that came in through a port and was found in someone's backyard, and that person was able to alert um, the authorities. Um, we get um, different kinds of thrips as well, and one that um, gets talked about a lot in Melbourne is citrus gall wasp. Here, this is a, a photo of um, actually <laughs> my neighbor's um, lemon tree, which is riddled with galls. And um, I, uh, I, I'm running a bit of an experiment and I strip back these galls. So you can see the, the chambers of the wasps here, just to see if I can um, save this plant. But you'll start to get adults coming out of these chambers um, as we move into the warmer weather. So, in terms of picking out an exotic from an endemic, of course, it's going to be a very rare occurrence. Um, and it's going to be very, very hard to do. So you might get, um, we might have endemic species here that look like exotic species, those exotics that we class as high priority exotic species, 
or they might behave in a similar way or produce similar damage. So it's, it's, it's a difficult task. And this is where, um, as we say, getting to know what's in your garden um, can really help um, notify you as to whether you should um, be a little bit wary or not. So here's just an example of how what we call a high priority exotic, so brown mumbrate sink bug, which is one I've spoken about before, um, can look quite similar to species that we already have in Australia. So we have a whole suite of shield bug insects that can look quite similar. I've got harlequin bug up the top here, which is also a plant pest, and a crusader bug on the bottom right here. And they look quite similar. So what would perhaps alert you as to whether if you had brown mumbrated stink bug, if you should be concerned or not. Well, many of um, these priority plant pests uh, tend to be very good at traveling. So if you find an insect that you have never seen before or any invertebrate that you've never seen before and you find it after perhaps receiving something that's come from overseas, perhaps a a parcel or um, in non-COVID times, if you have visitors from overseas and they've brought luggage across, then um, you should perhaps think, is there a possibility that this unknown species came in um, with, with that item? Are you noticing that it's damaging a wide variety of plants in your garden or at your community garden? So these exotic pests that are classed as priority are class that as, as a priority plant pest because they have a very wide host range. And is the damage quite severe? So those would be some red flags. And better to be safe than sorry, as Alia did say. Um, calling the plant pest hotline does put you in, in touch with experts where they can assess the situation. And here's another one. So I've spoken about spotted wing drosophila earlier um, in week one. And it does have a look-alike in Australia. Uh, it has a few, but one that is very cosmopolitan and we often find in our gardens and in our compost is Drosophila melanogaster, the vinegar fly. And actually someone did ask what might be in my compost. It could very well be the vinegar fly. So spotted wing Drosophila is um, considerably more of a pest because it can lay its eggs in, root, um, in a fruit that is still ripening on the vine. So again, if you've found you have an insect that you haven't seen before and perhaps you have recently bought some imported fruit and you're getting fruit that is on the stem, it's not yet ripe and there are no um, large wounds on the plant where vinegar fly could lay its eggs, but you're getting an infestation in any case. Um, and if you have, uh, if you're noticing a large range of plants in your um, garden are getting infested, then those are some additional red flags. So just taking some, um, some data from New Zealand here, this is from 2008, and I actually expect that this number would have gone up since then with their awareness activities. But at this point, 49% of um, all exotic um, plant pest detections uh, were being were resulting from reports made by the general public. So that's actually a um, pretty huge proportion when you think about it. And we definitely have examples where people in the community have made reports of exotic pests and saved um, agricultural industries a significant amount of money, but also really benefited um, anyone living in a city where these pests could cause a lot of um, problems. So over the last couple of years, we've had instances of warehouse workers working in Melbourne and Sydney where they've unpacked some imported items and found brown marmorated sink bug and called it in. And there's a couple of really good um, examples in New Zealand where, first of all, um, a manager of a hotel called the authorities about a bug found in a room. Um, it did turn out to be brown marmorated sink bug and fortunately, that room um, had windows that were sealed shut. And it just so happened that a couple of days um, prior to that, they had had uh, a contingent of um, people from the US staying in that hotel 
which may very well have brought, well, would have brought luggage over from the US. And a cleaner in New Zealand was cleaning a house and found a strange looking bug and reported that to the authorities. And it just so happened that the owners of that house had recently hosted um, some friends from New York who had come over and obviously this bug had, um, had found that their luggage was a nice place to hide out and uh, woken up in a completely different uh, country. So just some um, tips uh, as, um, as we um, head to the close of the session. We've talked a bit about getting to know what's in your garden um, and Aaliyah certainly talked about perhaps some traps that you can, you can try out in your garden to find out um, what pests um, or insects are in your garden. So you could put out a sticky trap or pitfall trap or, or try a shelter trap. Be mindful of what um, would and should appear in your garden according to the season. So whether you're heading into spring or you're in summer or heading into autumn. Have a look at some tools that you can use to help you get to know um, what species are around your neighbourhood, like iNaturalist. Um, learn how to find a GPS point on your phone and, the, um, and use the HD function um, of your phone camera. And remember, uh, the exotic plant pest hotline, if you can't remember the number, and we certainly don't expect you to, that's, um, those are the words that you should Google, exotic plant pest hotline if you want to know where to, um, where to report a suspect detection. And they do get taken very seriously. So here's a news article from 2019 where a very large ship full of imported cars was turned around because a brown mummer sink bug um, infestation was found on board. So a lot of people were waiting a very long time for their cars to come in after that had happened. If you want to know a little bit more, I suggest you Google national priority plant pests. The government have what they call a top 40 list of priority pests that are found throughout the world, but not found in Australia, um, that we want to make sure that we don't have. And pests like spotted wing Drosophila are on there and certainly brown marmorated sink bug. And there is also a Facebook page that's been set up by Australian Biosecurity. So they put lots of case studies and stories on that Facebook page. And you can actually find that by um, searching at Australian Biosec. And there's a new network that's been set up by the Victorian government called the Urban Plant Health Network, which you can Google. And they put these really handy blog posts on there about um, gardening in general, but also some information about exotic pests as well. And accessing your local knowledge networks, your community gardens and your gardening groups um, to learn a bit more about what's in your garden is really important. And that's a really good segue for next week. Helen will be talking to us about um, garden hygiene practices and presenting a few case studies. Helen, um, I might hand over to you if we um, probably have two more minutes to spend if you would like to take us through um, the next section before we come to a close. Sure. Um, so we just, um, thanks Jess. We, we thought we would um, ask a few questions really just to get to know a little bit better who's with us this evening. And so that we can start to, you know, build a picture of um, the types of the types of support that could be offered to, to backyard gardeners and community gardeners. So we're just going to, before we close, we'll just run quite quickly through a, a couple of questions. Um, Jess, did you want to just mention the annotate function? Yes. Um, so for those of you who have never used the annotate function, it's quite fun once you do learn how to use it. So you'll see at the top of the screen here, um, you are viewing Caesar's screen in a, it's a long green button. And if you go to the right and click view, um, view options, and then scroll down, you'll see there's an annotate feature. So if you just click that, you'll, um, you'll come up with a toolbar. Great, thank you. So what we'll do just to, to round up, um, if you use one of the stickers, so there's, I think there are ticks and hearts and stars and it doesn't matter which you use. 
um, if you let us know how long have you been an avid urban greener? So how long have you been gardening? Doesn't matter where, um, just let us know to get a sense of what level of experience you've all got. And while you're doing that, if you have any questions about um, the last talk, please feel free to ask. Great, lots of lots of ticks and a quite a variety of response. We've got some. Yeah, some really experienced gardeners with us as well, which is fantastic to see. Thanks everyone. Yeah, great network we'll to be part that. of. If you, yeah, save and clear that would be great. There you go. Thanks Jess. And then just one final question. For those of you that um, thought that, you know, since particularly since the situation that we've found ourselves in, um, this year, if your amount of gardening or gardening activity has increased or decreased, if you could just write, use the text function and just write a couple of words in there as to, you know, what those reasons are. So for some people, have they've said to us that um, access has been a problem. Um, we're really keen and we know that there's been, there has been um, some lobbying to try to keep community gardens active and, and open um, at particular phases of um, the, you know, the social restrictions. So we're just really keen to, to understand, um, you know, what your reasons are. And certainly from my perspective, I've spent more time at home, working from home, and it, it is much easier to wander out into the garden, have a bit of a look round and, and keep going with a few jobs. So, yeah. I'll, I'll, just, ask, answer, I'll just answer this question from um, Pierre while, while we're doing this, Helen. It's aphids on roses, is pyrethrin or soapy water okay in respect to other beneficial insects? Um, we definitely um, suggest that you stay away from use of pyrethrin because it will definitely have an impact on beneficial insects. Um, the soapy water might have less of an impact simply because um, some beneficial insects have wings. We might be able to fly away from that. Um, but it might be um, the best option just to wait a little while and see um, and, and, and wait to, for your beneficial insects to start um, laying their eggs in aphid populations and for their larvae to grow up, particularly hoverflies and, and ladybird beetle larvae, and for them to start predating those aphids, as well as your parasitoid wasps. Great. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks everybody, that gives us some some insights and um, really nice to see that for most of you, you, you're still getting plenty of time in your gardens. So let that, let that may continue. Thanks so Thanks, much, Jeff. everyone. Well, oh, we've still got an annotation on the final screen. That's okay. <laughs> um, look, uh, we have uh, our last session next week. So um, stay tuned. I'll send you an email with the details about that session. And once again, thanks everyone so much for joining us.